Hi, welcome everyone to another Hospitalaris online meetup. A uh, few announcements before we get started. Uh, first, Zuri Hack 2021 is taking place uh, very soon this month, uh, June 18 to 20. I hope to see you all there. And uh, second, we're always looking for speakers who would like to present at one of these meetups here. If you have something hospital related that you find interesting, then please let us know either on the meetup platform or on Slack or anywhere else. Um, and uh, yeah, with that out of the way, it's my great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Francesco Mazzoli, um, who will tell us about backpropagation in hospital. Over to you, Francesco. Thanks. So um, yeah, so this is out of a blog post that I published a couple of weeks ago, maybe a bit more. And um, the idea was like um, how, you know, there's this neural network craze, of course, I'm a bit late to the party, but the idea was like, let's try to get a non-trivial um, neural network thing going with as little code as possible, right? So that all the pieces were there, but it was very e easy to understand and it made clear what the components are, right? And uh, the key sort of machinery that allows for training um, neural networks is called backpropagation. Uh, it was called like that in, in the 80s, I think in the mid 80s, but the core algorithm underpinning it is from the 70s, I think actually. So this is not, nothing new that I'm going to <laughs> show here. Um, but I found out that somebody else had already had this idea and did something minimal like this in Python. So I kind of reworked that and, and the, the network that I'm showing, the neural network that I'm showing uh, is, is, is a pretty like direct port of that project called Micrograd. But the way I do it is quite different because it's, it's in Haskell and it's using a library to do a lot of the heavy lifting, but you know, we'll get there. But um, yeah, to start uh, this, this, this diagram, this animation shows what we're going to do. So here in the top half, uh, we have some points, some noisy points that are sampled from two semicircle shapes, right? Uh, I'm going to call them moons. Um, and this is a nice test case for various reasons, but like the idea is that you've got these two shapes and uh, you want to learn how to classify them. So you want some uh, function that given a coordinate anywhere here, it tells us whether it thinks it's in the upper shape or in the lower shape. Of course, as humans, we could simply write a very short function that detects that, right? Uh, but the idea is to show a task which is not trivial, um, that can be learned by a simple network. Uh, and by the way, I don't know that I have enough material to draw for an hour and a half. And I'm very happy to take questions. Um, and also the idea here is that I'm not, I'm not going to assume anything about neural network knowledge, just a bit of calculus knowledge, but not even that really. Uh, so if you don't un understand any key co concept, I, you know, please ask, uh, because I think that's more interesting. Um, but uh, for, for example, if you don't understand what the goal he is, which is totally fine, uh, please let me know, uh, because that's, that's very important. And um, so yeah, we've got these two shapes, this, this red one and this blue one. And uh, what's going on here is that the network uh, is learning how to separate these two shapes, right? And this black line sort of uh, shows where it thinks they separate, right? So it starts out as really bad and then it's slowly sort of uh, figures out where this, uh, where the two shapes uh, end up begin essentially. And here in the lower part, we have a um, um, plot, like it, like it shows how good uh, the, the network gets as time goes on. So you can see it's got some bumps, but it's generally trending down, which is a good thing. So yeah, that's what we're going to do. And as I was mentioning, the goal is to show all the moving parts in, in, in neural network training uh, without much code and without assuming knowledge um, in, in neural networks. So if you already know even vaguely how neural networks work, you're going to be kind of bored probably. Um, and uh, yeah, some, some basic knowledge of calculus is assumed, but really not very much, just what a partial derivative is essentially. Um, and even then, like I give some intuition that hopefully helps you understand what is happening. And the code is at this address and the blog post is at this address if you want to visit those. 
And these are some credits. Again, the sample network is taken from Micrograd, which is a very nice Python project uh, done by a person that knows immensely more than me <laughs> about neural networks. This is the guy who is OpenAI head or maybe a test, like it's a really important um, deep learning guy. Uh, and it's a very, very nice project. And the um, core algorithm, we're not going to implement it. Uh, it's powered by this library called AD by Edward Met, which is a very neat library uh, that I recommend to everybody to check it out. It's just very, very nicely designed library. And I'm going to explain how it works or how a part of it works. So what are the steps? Uh, the first thing I'm going to explain is what the network looks like. By the way, I don't know how people can interrupt me, uh, Andreas. Maybe we should say, like, in the chat or whatever. I don't know because again, I really, I'm really happy to take any questions at any point. Uh, yeah. Essentially, down to your preference. If you're, if you prefer to just be interrupted, we can also do that. Yeah, I mean, it's not many people, right? It's like what is it, 15, 20 people? So I think it's totally fine if you just, if you just, uh, uh, if you just uh, ask. But uh, the, the problem is that if you do write in the chat, I'm not sure if I see it because I haven't used Zoom in a while. So maybe if if that uh, happens, there was a black box on the bottom of the upper chart was that just a zoom artifact or was that meaningful on this, this, this what on the on like it's on it was top right of the on chart? the chart it was right on the chart in I, I think um, that's... between x oh negative 0.5 and point and zero and then right at the bottom okay. of the chart I, is this probably still a zoom artifact but no it's not i i okay. think it's uh i think uh, francesca if you mouse over the image then it's probably some tool tip, tip or something that shows up as an ah, artifact in zoom. like now oh yeah yeah that's it okay yeah Thanks. good but um it might be some kind of meaningful like we don't know what's going on here or something okay no, that, that's that's good that's good by the way nice to <laughs> to speak to you again steven i don't know i don't know this work here so so that's great um good so yeah feel free to interrupt me or write in the chat or if i don't whatever if i don't reply in the chat just Again, interrupt me. Um, right, so what were we saying? Right, so I will first explain the kind of network we're going to use here. And it's like, not the simplest kind of network, but I will say the sim second simplest. Uh, and we're going to define it in ASCO. Then I'm going to frame the problem that we want to solve uh, as, this, as a simple network of this type. Um, and then I'm going to explain how backpropagation works and also give like, it's going to be powered by the AD library. Um, and finally, we're going to train the network uh, to um, to achieve this result. But the training part is almost an interesting, like the interesting part is understanding how everything fits, fits together. Uh, so, so yeah. Right, so the term neural network, like, like it's pretty broad, what a neural, like what shape neural networks can take. And, um, I'm not going to talk about modern ones, which are usually very deep and convolutional. Um, we're going to use a very, very simple type of networks in this in type of network in this in this uh, talk. Um, and this type of network is called multi-layer perceptor, and it looks like this diagram. So what this diagram shows is that we've got a bunch of inputs that go in the network. So these are the inputs to the function that we want to learn eventually. In this case, this network has got three and some outputs uh, that come out. Uh, and in this case, we've got two. And in the middle between the inputs and the outputs, we have some uh, uh, neurons. And the neurons are organized in layers. So these columns, you know, each of these columns um, is a layer in the network. And these arrows show how the data flows. Um, and I should say, all the computation in neural networks in general, um, well, that's not, not entirely true in modern ones because you have stuff like pooling and whatnot. But in this case, all the computation happens in the neurons. So we're going to explain how that works. But like, You've got these arrows that show how the data flows. And in these blue circles, all the computation happens. So for example, the input x1 um, goes as an input of all the neurons in the first layers. So each of these neurons takes all of the inputs. So they all have three inputs in this case in the first layer. And then each of the neurons produces only one output. So three things go in and one thing goes out in this first layer. And for each output for, of each neuron, it, they, they all, all get fanned out, fanned out to the next layer. So in the second layer, 
each neuron is going to have four inputs because they take all the outputs of the previous layer and produce only one output. And in the last layer, in this case, it's two neurons. neurons. Each of them, again, takes four inputs and produces one output for a total of two outputs. And so you've got neuron, smallest unit, let's say, and then you've got a layer, and the entire thing is the network uh, itself, the multilayer perceptron. You can see my cursor, right? So if I circle around, it's, it's, it's shown. OK, good. Yeah. Right. Um, so we said that all computation happens in each neuron. And I'm going to explain what computation happens in the neuron. I'm not going to give a justification for it. Um, but like the intuition between neural networks is that like it's it's like a very structured function, right? You basically have a way to process these inputs into outputs in a way that is very regular and that lets us train the network, right? But I'm not going to be able to, and I mean, I don't fully understand myself, like why certain things work and certain things does, don't. I'm just going to explain how the computation happens. And uh, it's a fairly simple computation. So for each neuron, if we've got n inputs, um, each input gets multiplied by a weight. So this is like a number in the neuron. It's like a parameter of the neuron. So yeah, each input gets multiplied by a weight. And then this, um, this product gets summed up and also summed up with a bias. Uh, and this sum gets fed into an activation function. So for people that, that, that know a bit of linear algebra, this is like a linear operation, just multiplying and adding. So it's fairly simple in some sense. And the activation function is used to uh, add some you know, richness <laughs> or flavor of texture <laughs> to what the neuron does. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be able to learn um, interesting, th many interesting things. Although that some interesting things are linear, but not that many. So, so that's all that happens in a neuron. And inputs go in, each input can multiply by a weight. These products all get summed up and then they get summed also with a bias. This whole thing gets fed into an activation function. And there are many activation functions. We'll only use one, which I will show later. Uh, but again, you can think, okay, I'm doing something very simple here. And then I'm adding, I'm sprinkling some, some, some complexity on top with the activation function. And again, it's quite crucial that we do this. Um, yeah, and if you want me to drill down on any concept, again, feel free to, feel free to ask. And in ASCO, we're going to represent this very, very straightforwardly. Uh, we have a record, uh, we call it neuron, and they have a bunch of weights and they have a bias. And then we can call the neuron with some inputs. So the inputs are this x, s, um, this vector. And then we uh, zip the inputs with the weights, multiplying as we go along. And then we sum these this, this products. And then we add the bias. And then we call the activation function, which is given from above. Um, uh, the reason why we pass the activation function from above is that we want to store this in a first order way. We just want the data. And their reason will become clear later. Uh, we also do everything generically. So we just say that it's like some kind of number that the neuron contains. And we derive functor foldable and terraceable for this data type. And this, again, is quite important considering what we want to do later. Mm. And uh, yeah, so that, that's what a neuron, that's how a neuron works. This is actually true across basically all neural networks, uh, even the modern ones. That's how a neuron computes, generally speaking. And I, yeah, again, if, you, if anything is not clear in the Haskell definition or in the definition of the thing itself, just let me know. Um, then we assemble neurons into layers. So these are one of these columns, right? Um, and this is, again, like very, very predictable. Uh, so a layer is a vector of neurons. They're all stacked on top of each other in the diagram. And when you call a layer, you have n inputs, and all of the inputs get passed to all of the neurons, right? So if you have five inputs to the layer, each neuron will be given these five inputs to compute, which is what this map is doing, right? So for each of the neurons, we call call neuron with all the inputs. And if I go back to this diagram, this is sort of represented by the fact that each of these neurons has got three arrows coming into it, right? Uh, so you sort of forward all the inputs to each neuron in the layer. 
Is it meaningful that activation is always an endomorphism in your definitions? Uh, so, okay, what I'm trying to remember here is what is an endomorphism? Uh, a to like, A instead of A to B. Right, yes. So that's kind of, that, that's, yeah. So, right. So, so the reason why this is generic and not just double is that we're going to use a strange number type to do the algorithm later. That said, I wouldn't imagine this to be anything than some number type. And you will carry the same number type throughout the network. So although these definitions would work with A to B, just the same, and the whole infrastructure. I figured, I figured that, that, that because your program works with them being the same, it must be meaningful. That, uh, I, I understand, I understand. So, 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 yeah. So, I think it's not very meaningful to have them different. Although, like, it's interesting when you start poking, and this was part of my goal, when you start poking of why certain decisions are made in neural networks, it's often that they aren't challenged for a very long time. Uh, this is true for activation functions that were. They, Everybody was using like sigmoids or logistic function, like, you know, these sort of functions for a while, and then people started using something else, or like whether you do stochastic gradient descent or other stuff. So maybe maybe we should change number of types and go from float 16 to float 32 between layers. But I I don't know. Yeah, it's conceivable that that may may, may make sense. Yeah. So thanks for the question. And any, any anything else? Okay. Good. So. Um, so yeah, so for, for, for these layers, we forward all the inputs to each of the neurons and we get back a number of outputs. Uh, how many outputs we get depends on how many neurons we've got. Four neurons, four outputs, six neurons, six outputs, and so on. And finally, we stack a bunch of layers into uh, an MLP, so a multi-layer perceptron. Um, now, Again, this is just very predictable. It's just a bunch of layers. If we go back here, in this case, we might have, you know, we will have these three layers, right? But it might be deeper or flatter. Like it just the topology of the network depends on you. But we are going to restrict uh, networks to have only one output in this talk. This is a very artificial restriction. Uh, you know, you might very well want multiple outputs. It's just that it makes the code a bit simpler and our example only has one output. Um, and given that, this is what call MLP looks like. But first I need to speak about what activation function we're going to use. So remember the activation function is what we do after the multiply and add. And in this case, we're going to use uh, what's called ReLU. Re stands for rectifier, LU I think for linear unit. This is a fantastically simple function. Uh, it just sets everything negative to zero and everything else lives the same. So it's like a 45 degree line on the positive side of the axis and a flat line on the left side. Uh, this is surprisingly popular in real world um, networks. Uh, it turns out that this sort of segment, right? This sort of, uh, uh, this sort of break that it introduces is enough non-linearity to, uh, um, to, to, for, for, for a lot of neural networks. And uh, the big breakthroughs that were had in the early 2010s were using ReLU throughout. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's not like a toy example. But there are many activation functions. Here, we're just going to use this one uh, because it works in this example and that's what the example uses. And what we do is that in call MLP, which is what turns the inputs into the single output um, for our network, we keep calling call layer like it's like you're going to have, I don't know, five inputs and then you've got 10 neurons. So you're going to get 10 outputs and then maybe you have another 10 neurons and you get another 10 output. And then maybe you have a, you must have a single neuron on the end to get our single output because we're restricting the networks to have a single output. So this is what this fold is doing. This is to generate until the second, the second to last layer, just keeps calling call layer with ReLU as the activation function. And then at the end, it calls call layer with no activation function at all. So we leave the output as is without an activation function. And the reason is that we're going to add the activation function later. Uh, uh, we're just going to have to do something else before adding the activation function. So this is what the MLP looks like in Haskell. 
And just to recap, a neuron takes n inputs and produces a single output. A layer is made out of a bunch of neurons. And so they take some inputs and it produce some number of outputs. And the network as the overall thing, like the multi-layer perception perceptron that we've defined, takes a number of inputs and produces a single output. And notably, we have functor foldable traversable instances for our MLP type. What this functor and foldable and traversable instances give us access to is all the data in the network. And what is the data in the network? The weights and biases in the neurons. That's it, right? So we will be able to easily traverse throughout all the, in a generic way, throughout all the um, data in the neurons. Now, it's very important that if any of this doesn't make sense, you ask me now, uh, because we're going to build on this, of course. But if everybody's happy, I'm going to go ahead. You said there is one output, but you have one y1, y2. Yeah, you're right. I was lazy, and I didn't prepare <laughs> a diagram with one output. Okay. Right, that's good observation, though. Uh, sorry. <laughs> OK, good. So we go back to the original problem. now. We have this um, two interlocking semicircles. Uh, we're going to call them moons because they kind of look like crescents. Um, so first of all, why is this test case interesting? It's interesting because some simple classifiers will not be able to uh, tell them apart. For example, you can't divide these two moons with a single line, right? If you were trying to draw a line here that, that, that cleanly separates them, you wouldn't be able to. And that's why, for example, not having an activation function here wouldn't really work. Like if, you, if your network was just a, a, some linear operation, it wouldn't be able to, 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 to separate these two together. But I mean, for example, it, even, even if you had like these sort of like convex, convex shapes, for example, you wouldn't be able to separate them, right? So it's got this nice, you know, interlocking concave nature that makes them a bit annoying to deal with with classifiers that uh, are kind of simple minded, minded right? So it's a, it's a nice test case. Um, and, um, and and so so how are we going to structure this? Well, the input is pretty clear. It's x and y coordinates of points, uh, right? So that's what the input would be. And the output is going to be a single number. And we're going to say, well, the network should return minus one if the point is part of the upper moon and one if it's part of the lower moon. This is very common with classifiers. And we're going to use also some other infrastructure that works with this notion. Um, and, uh, and, and, and yeah, like essentially what we're going to say is like, okay, ideally like you want minus one for upper moon and one for lower moon, but we're going to assume that every, anything that is negative, like any a negative output is going to be upper moon and any positive up, output is going to be uh, lower moon, which is what this diagram shows, right? This black line is the zero line, which tells us where things uh, change, switch from upper moon to low, lower moon, essentially. So, so yeah, so that's the problem, and that's how, you know the function we want. We want a function that takes coordinates as inputs, minus one, or you know within minus one and one as output, with this property that it should separate these two shapes. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do to, to, to do this, like we're going to set up a network to 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 do this, and this network should have two inputs and one output. And I'm just going to tell you what 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 topology we're going to use. We're going to use a network with two layers of 16 neurons and then a single neuron at the end. Now, again, I'm not going to justify this too much. <laughs> it's just like, this is a network that works. And I didn't even come up with this. Like, you know, uh, this other guy came up with this. But this is a bit of an art, right? There is no science to understanding, OK, what kind of layers do you want? Like, it's a bit of dark, you know, black magic. Um, but, uh, but in this case, we're going to have two layers of 16 neurons and then a single neuron to, to get the output out. And uh, what, does zero represent uncertainty then? Uh, here? In the output? Yeah, in oh, the output. yeah, yeah. So, well, um, it represents more we're getting to the edge of the moon than uncertainty, right? It's like, I mean, if you look at this diagram, you can, you know, there's a clear geometric interpretation here, which is like 
the network thinks that the moon is ending here and then it starts, the other moon starts here. So it's some sort of elevation map, right? For the two moons. So, so no, it semantically doesn't mean, well, I, I mean, it, it is a fact that uh, the closer you get to the border, the more uncertain you are, right? Because it might be sort of on the cusp, but in, in practice, it's like a it's sort of separation, right? But I, I, I guess it's got some, certainty implications I suppose yeah but um, that, yeah one, one part that was fun is doing this graph which is a nice representation of what the network learns um, does that make it does that make sense uh, yeah okay right so we have this network 16 neurons 16 neurons and then a single neuron to get a single output out and what we do and this is through you know I mean in Big and fancy networks is that we initialize the network with random stuff inside it. Um, and with random stuff, we mean weights between minus one and one. This is very common and popular. Um, and zero bias, right? So it starts with this sort of uniformly distributed weights and no bias. Uh, again, I, I'm not going to just, I mean, justifying all these sort of uh, design choices would take very long. Um, and I probably wouldn't do a great job at it anyway, but that that's kind of the fairly standard practice, like uh, uh, in terms of how, like the fact that the the, the weights um, are normalized this way, and that there is no bias. Um, so 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 this is fairly standard, and this is fairly uninteresting code, saying okay, I want an MLP with two inputs and two layers of sixteen neurons. And this init MLP function is just sort of initializing all the weights and biases in the neurons. So I've explained what the network looks like, and hopefully I've convinced you that we can feed two numbers in this network and get another number out, and roughly how that works. <clears throat> but we haven't explained how to train this at all, right? Which is the uh, interesting part, I suppose. Um, and uh, what Training a network means, and this is again true even in the super fancy ones, like it doesn't really make a difference. <clears throat> it means to find weights and bias values, right? All those, all those numbers so that we get a good result. Uh, and we're going to define what a good result means, but this is just true across the board. Like in, in practice, what you're doing is finding what numbers to put in the neurons. That's what training the neural network means. That's, that's not nothing else. Uh, and you have a computer to find them, right? You set up the, 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 the environment, but the computer finds them. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. And the rest of the talk is explaining how to do this. Uh, but like we've already gone through for, you know, a few key concepts that you should have clear in your mind what the, what, you know, what they, why we set them up more or less. Um, now we get on how to do it. And to how to do it, uh, we're going to take a small detour um, because we need to explain this wonderful algorithm, which is like so simple and so useful. Uh, it's probably should be taught more, I think, in school because it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like sorting, but, uh, but for, for optimization, for mathematical optimization, it's, like, it's so useful. Maybe sorting is not a great analogy, but it's like pops up everywhere and it's, it works so well it's, and it's so simple to do. It's like really great. Um, and this algorithm is automatic differenti differentiation. In this case, we're going to use reverse mode, automatic differentiation. Um, should, well, yeah, there are two modes. There is reverse mode and forward mode. A reverse mode is what we're interested in because reverse mode automatic differentiation works for functions that have many inputs and one output. And this is our case, although not for the reason you might be thinking of, because I haven't introduced the function that we're going to run this on yet. So well, what does automatic differentiation do? So let's say that you've got this function f that takes um, n inputs and returns one output. So invoking this function would look a bit like this. You've got uh, all these inputs and you got a single output out. Automatic differentiation gives us the partial derivatives for each of these inputs, essentially. Um, we're going to call these gradients, usually. And it's important to understand, it doesn't give you a formula to compute the partial derivatives for f. It just, it just works like this. You give it some inputs, and it gives you the partial derivatives for each of the inputs at that point. 
right, for that specific point. So it computes them on the fly. That's what the algorithms, uh, that, that's what automatic differentiation do. So you don't get out some sort of symbols that say, how, this is how you compute them. You just get the values out. And if you don't have a great grasp on what this partial derivatives mean, they kind of tell you, okay, if I change this input, how am I going to change the output, essentially, right? Or that's the intuition that is most useful here. Sort of gives you an idea, okay, if I play with these inputs, if I vary them a bit, how is the output going to change? Is it going to grow? Is it going to, um, uh, what's the opposite of grow? Uh, oh God, shrink? shrink. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, like it tells you, if you play with these inputs, what's going to output with the output? And we've got a single output as we, as we saw, as we saw in, in, you know, in this case. So what would such an algorithm look like in Haskell? Like what, what do we expect the um, type signature for this algorithm to be? Well, F, and this is like a very, very dumb way of representing it, might look something like this. We've got a list of doubles and we got a double out for this many inputs, single output. We would expect the automatic differentiation algorithm to have this kind of signature. You give me a function F and I give you another function where you put inputs in and I get gradients out. So if you put a list of numbers here, you would expect a list of numbers of equal length getting the gradients for each of the inputs. So again, like, yeah, how the, yeah, the gradients for each of the input. And this is essentially what, a, what the grad function from AD, which is this library I mentioned gives us, but with slightly different types, which I'm going to, I'm going to explain now. So what are the differences? Uh, the general um, shape is similar. So we've got a function as the first argument, but let's look at this function. Before we had a list of doubles to a single double. Now we have an F of reverse SA to reverse SA. And let's go in order. But the F means that we don't need to use lists. We can use any traversables as the input to this function. So it sort of frees us to use whatever composite structure we want for the function that we want to compute the gradients of, right? And you probably see where this is going because we define the MLP as traversable. So that would work as, uh, as an argument to this function. And maybe the weirder part is this reverse SA. So in the previous slide, we had a list of doubles. Here we've got a traversable thing of reverse SAs. Um, and the, the way this works is that uh, automatic differentiation needs to store like information about the function itself as it executes, right? So this reverse SA is a fancy number type that lets automatic differentiation keep track of what's happening so that it can give you the gradients, right? Uh, so, so that's what this reverse SA does. It's like, if there is a number type A, it wraps it up in a bit more information to be able to give you the gradients back. And I won't go into this in depth unless you, you guys are interested, in which case I can't, but this is a rather neat trick called reflection that lets us do this in a safe way. It's quite like, um, I mean, it's safe for the same reason why uh, the ST monad is safe, for example, because under the hood, this operation is not pure, actually. So this is like a little nugget here, but we can, we can talk more about it later if you guys want. But, but you know, this in itself is quite neat. Uh, in most uh, other languages, you, would, you wouldn't find a pure function that encapsulates this so nicely. So, so, so yeah, we've got this input function that goes from a traversable of this fancy thing to a single fancy thing. And then the output is a function that goes from a traversable of A to another traversable of A. And A can be anything. Uh, it can be any number rather. And we're always going to use double precision floating point numbers, but we could put integers in it if the uh, function is, um, is, uh, um, is integral. Um, or we could put some you know, complex numbers or whatever. Does that work? <laughs> I've never tried it. I guess it, it probably does work. <laughs> but um, so, so that's, that's, that's what it looks like. And we can try this out immediately, right? So let's say that we've got a func the function x times y plus uh, sin x. We can ask grad what the gradients, partial derivatives at point one and two, so x equals one, y equals two um, are, and it just gives them to us, right? Or something like, you know, this sort of product of all three inputs, 
at one, two, and three. And again, it gives us the gradients, like it doesn't complain, whatever the function is, even if the function is not differentiable, right? Kind of suspicious, it's like magic, how can it do that? Uh, but uh, if, if you look at how automatic differentiation work, it's really quite, uh, quite nice. Of course, the results are going to be kind of nonsensical if the function is not differentiable, uh, but, um, but it's, you know, it's quite well defined how it behaves. Uh, maybe I will write a blog post on automatic differentiation only because it desires more love, maybe. Uh, th does that make sense vaguely, what this function does for us? Not how it works, because I haven't explained it, but does, does, that, does that make sense? And if it doesn't, what doesn't? All good? Okay. Um, so, Francesca? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one just question about the reverse S. Mm -hmm. So, like, can I just think of that as like recording state about all the times, like an A, you know, about all the operations that were performed on an A or something like that? That's exactly what it does. So, the tape here refers to the, what is it, Bengal tape or whatever it's called. Essentially, you build up a list internally of all the operations that happen. You kind of build a syntax tree or a graph of what F does to the inputs. And then you use that graph to compute the gradients. Um, so, 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 yeah, actually, this thing will take memory that is linear in the number of operations that this function uh, does. Because you need to store this graph and then traverse this, this graph backwards from the output, from the node that represents the output, to compute the gradients. That's why this is called reverse mode automatic differentiation. Forward mode doesn't need the graph and computes in constant time, um, but it doesn't work for uh, functions with multiple inputs and one output. It does the reverse, one input and multiple outputs. So again, if you guys want, we can build down more on automatic differentiation. Maybe we should finish the normal part first, but, uh, but it's, it's really neat, yeah. And, and note that you've got this rarefies S tape here, right? So what this does is that you've got this uh, um, universally quantified variable uh, that you can't really inspect in any meaningful way, but that the algorithm used to actually store this data structure at the type level with the trick called reflection. There is actually a package also by command called reflection that lets you do this. So it, it, you know, it's it's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on here actually, but yeah. Cool. Thanks, Fra Francesca. Just to. <clears throat> I, I believe, because I, I had a chat with Connell Elliott a few years ago about this, mm -hmm. and I've read some other stuff, but I don't think you need to... This is one way of implementing reverse mode. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason it's got implemented like this, I think, is because the algorithm's de described in a very uh, stateful way. And mm -hmm. actually, you can if you describe the, the algorithm in a non-stateful way, then you don't need to do this. And maybe it's even constant in time like forward forward mode I that's just so if you're going to no, write your blog if you're going to write your blog on AD I'd be I'd love to read that yeah so, <laughs> but I think so, that's a that's quite a lot of work in what well, it would be for me anyway yeah right right so okay so what is the problem here here the poor grad function needs to work with a function that it knows nothing about you can stick whatever you like in it okay if you start with a computation graph which I'm sure you know, Connell is all about computation, you know, graphs and like yeah. all this sort of stuff. So uh, like, yeah, I can imagine him having fun with this. Like if you start with a known graph, you don't need this. And in fact, if you use PyTorch or TensorFlow, they don't do this, right? They, they, you basically describe what your layers look like in a fairly static way. And then you do need to store stuff, but if you know the graph up front, you don't need this magic. But the cool thing about the grad function is that you can just stick any function in it, right? And to do that, you need you need to build the graph uh, somewhere, yeah. and this is a very neat way of doing it uh, that doesn't expose any state. Essentially. So yeah, ho hopefully that, that 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 makes a bit of sense. So I would imagine that Connell would say, well, you kind of define your fu function call to mean something else, right? Some, some other categorical, you know, representation uh, of function, uh, or whatever, uh, and then maybe uh, it works out. I don't know. Yeah. Now I I think my vague understanding is with one mode you're doing you're doing the adjoint of the I'm, I'm waving my hands around here but you can't see me 
No, I think it's, no. it's, it's basically an ad. Yeah, it's, anyway, never, well, never mind. I don't want to distract you, but I think there are better ways of now. We know better ways of doing this, but I may, I could be completely wrong. So, uh, so this, yeah, no, and it is very clever. I agree, it's very clever. And I, yeah. no, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to distract you there. But no, that's, no, 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 no. You did the right thing. But yeah. uh, send me the reference. Or, or okay, I will. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, because I'm interested. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. I'm sure it's got very clever to say about this as you know with everything pretty much. So yeah. Um yeah, A anyone else about this automatic differentiation stuff? It's very important that what this does is kind of makes sense. Not how it does it again, but yeah. Okay, so okay, now we get to the cool part. So um we can use automatic differentiation to maximize or minimize functions. Uh, maximizing or minimizing function is called optimization in maths, of course. So I might call it optimization in the rest of the call. Um, so so let's pick this function, which I picked because it's got these nice saddles and many local maxima, which makes it clear that you know you're not getting the best, or maybe there are many bests. But anyway, like let's pick this function. It's um, cosine of x divided by two divided by two plus sine of y divided by four. This is a, a part of this surface. And let's focus on the point uh, minus three pi and pi, which is here, right? So let's say that we are here and we want to reach a maximum uh, in this function. What's the good strategy? Well, good, I mean, not, not, it's a strategy. You just say, okay, let's go where this is steepest, right? Let's look at this function and let's just sort of go upwards where it's currently steepest at this point. Let's go, just go straight by some amount. So yeah, you just, at that point, you're like, okay, you know, where, where is it pointing most upwards, right? And then let's go in a straight, like let's just multiply the current input by that direction. Um, and that's what gradient descent does, right? But how do we know what the steepest part is? We take the gradients uh, at that point. That's That's, that's that's what we use automatic differentiation for in this context, right? So let's actually try to do this. Uh, and I'll wait. I first need to introduce another function. <laughs> so 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 again, like the idea here should should make sense intuitively. You start from this point. You just look at where the out where the output grows most, and you go there, right? Uh, but to 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 do this with um, AD with the library, we have another neat function. It's like a helper function. You could implement it, I think, just with grad. It looks a bit like grad, so it still takes this function and it takes some inputs, but then you give it another function that basically says, okay, I'm going to give you one of the inputs, so a number stored in this traversable thing, and I'm going to give you its gradient, right? So how that input affects the output, essentially, I'm using fairly loose terminology here, but that, that's kind of essentially what, 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 what you've got here. And then you give me something else, and I will fill in the traversable with that with those something else, right? So for each input, I give you the gradient together with the input. You give me something else, I give you back the same data structure filled with these updated inputs. And we can immediately apply this to the gradient descent because we can see, okay, let's define the function, which is what we had before, uh, f. The parameters are x and y, and it's exactly like it was shown in the little math formula above. And then we repeatedly call grad width, where the update function for grad width is like, give me the inputs, give me the gradient, which I'm calling the x, and let's add the gradient times some constant, which is we're calling gamma here. It's called the learning rate in, um, excuse me, in the in in deep learning. So. So you take the yeah you take each input in this case each coordinate and you uh, you add to it the gradient times some constant and the constant I just picked four here because it looked good but it's just a way to scale okay how much am I walking upwards right um, also this is gradient ascent not descent since we're going up but the principle is exactly the same and then we can do this for example five times so we keep calling this update rule. On the on 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 you know recursively, and we see that we are indeed walking upwards, right? So it's very clear that this is this is working out. Uh, so the first step goes quite a bit up, and then it goes a bit more up, and then it slows down. Why does it does it slow down? Because the gradients get 
much less, right? Because like it, it, the curve lets, gets less steep, so you're going to have a, a smaller gradients. And so uh, this update rule is going to change the point less, right? So, um, so, so that's why it sort of gradually slows a bit, uh, slows a bit uh, uh, down. And, uh, and uh, what I wanted to do here is sort of give a bit of an intuitive, like, like a visualization of how gradient ascent in this case works. If we wanted to go down, it will work exactly the same, but we will subtract rather than um, add to the inputs, right? So here we're sort of walking up, but if we wanted to go down, we could have. Uh, in this case, it's a bit nicer to visualize a peak because it's more isolated. But, um, but yeah, so that, that's what we can do. And really, this is just mega simple. It's really quite nice. Uh, we should all be happy that we can do this. And it's not uh, like, this is not so academic or like cute. Like if you, if you use any optimization package, that lets you do really cool stuff, um, like uh, not only neural networks, you're most likely going to use automatic differentiation to get these gradients. Um, it's just an incredibly useful technique and knowing what it does is you know, very good, I think, for, for people using computers, well, programming computers. Uh, so does this make sense? Like how, how, how we're sort of walking upwards here? Okay, so, um, so we can go forward. We can go forward to telling you what backpropagation is. So backpropagation is using automatic differentiation to do gradient descent to tune the weights and biases of a neural network. That's what it is. That's all that it is. And like GPT-3 does this <laughs> at a massive scale, right? Where there are trillions of weights and biases. Uh, are they trillions or is it 100 billions? I don't remember. It's a big number. <laughs> uh, so, 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 so that 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 this concept scales all the way to these massive networks. So it's really the same thing. Uh, but I haven't explained what we're doing gradient descent on, right? I kind of explained what automatic differentiation and gradient descent is. But I mean, what do we do this on? What are we, you know, what is the function that we're doing gradient descent on? Well. <clears throat> The function that we're going to do gradient descent on is a function that tells us how good we're doing or rather how bad we're doing. So if we've got a function that tells us how bad we're doing and we minimize it, we're doing really good, right? <laughs> because we're not doing very bad. So, so we want to define some function that's called a loss function that tells us uh, given our network, how good the network is, is doing uh, or rather how bad the network is doing. It's like the output is going to be um, telling us how badly we're doing. So big output, we're not doing good. Small output, we're doing good. Uh, and what shall this loss function be? Um, when we train a neural network, we usually train it on sample data, training data. And the loss function is in large part, a measure of how distant we are from the training data. Let's say that we've got some training data that shows us some examples where, you know, that tells us how the function should behave. The last function is going to be something measuring how um, different uh, our network behaves compared to these test, you know, training data samples, right? If you understand how these pieces fit together, you really understand how this training works. Um, uh, now we're going to get into the details, but this is really it. Like, uh, uh, yeah, like one reason why I want to write it down is that like, if you search deep learning or whatever, they usually tell you to download PyTorch and like run these sort of obscenely big things. But at the core of it is really fairly simple concepts. It's quite crazy that they push them so far, I think. Um, I mean, it's, it's cool. But, uh, but at the core, it's, it's not a very complicated algorithm, right? Uh, it's, there are many moving parts. <clears throat> so any questions on this idea that's, that, of how it works? OK. Now, what, what is the loss function going to be in a bit more detail? Or, or rather, we've explained what the output of the loss function is. But what is the input, right? Because we're optimizing for some inputs, like we want to minimize the loss function with regards to some inputs. Our inputs, the numbers we want to compute, right? We want to, 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 to derive are the weights and biases of the neural network. How many weights and biases do we have in our sample network? Well, if you compute it, uh, it's 337, right? 
uh, because you've got these two layers and in the first layer they have two inputs you can just multiply right and it comes out at 337 so we're going to stick a function with 337 inputs and a single output which is the loss right how how, how badly we're doing into this gray in the center routine and at every step we're going to get slightly different inputs which is what we're trying to derive right again this is a crucial point like when you have GPT-3 and you're training it, you have R, but you've got a huge number here. Right? But essentially it is the same thing. Like it's, you're still sort of doing gradient ascent with automatic differentiation, uh, but just with a gigantic number of weights and biases and also a much different, not that much different, but quite different network structure. So they, they, the data flows in a different way. And uh, it was all sorts of tricks to 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 be able to to have these uh, networks work on, uh, um, on on complex data, and sometimes they make networks fight each other so that you don't even need uh, um, like uh, that much training data. Like there's a lot of tricks that you can do, but it, it essentially you've got you do have a function that you're trying to optimize for. Um, again, if you guys have any questions on this, mega important. So uh, and also we're almost done. <laughs> uh, so 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 yeah, go ahead and ask. Uh, and now to the details, uh, what is um, our loss function? Um, so I'm just going to go line by line. We're okay. going to define it, yeah. Not just can I interrupt you? Can you just yeah. give us an example of what the data actually looks like? Just oh, yeah, so day. yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so uh, the example that I'm going to give you, like concretely, is the training data for our network. This is going to be, uh, the input is going to be a coordinate and the output is going to be minus one or one, right? Which is like what we know is the, is the, is the result. So let's go back here. Look at, let's look at these points here. These points are colored, right? So we know what, what moons they uh, correspond to, right? So the training data set in this case is going to be a bunch of points, each labeled with whether they're from the upper moon and the lower moon, right? Okay. And that label is going to uh, be turned into a number, minus one or one, right? Okay. Another Thank example you. that actually works with multi-layer perceptrons. So multi-layer perceptrons are kind of antiquated, but in the 90s, if you were in the US and you had a check processed by a machine, it was most likely read by an OCR program that worked with a multi-layer perceptron, right? Uh, so you can go very far with multi-layer percept. Well, not that far, but quite far. And in that case, uh, the uh, data is a bunch of photos of numbers and what, like single digits, and what numbers they are, right? And in that case, you usually encode it as, uh, you know, the output is an array where the position in the array is what number it is. So it's like all zeros and a one on the third position if it's a three. Right, and you have a bunch of this data is labeled by humans and use it to train the network, uh, and then you can go into much more complicated stuff like image segmentation or depth estimation or all sorts of stuff. But um, we're going to look at a concrete example. Th does that make sense? Yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Okay, good. So, however, we're going to define the loss function in a generic way without assuming anything about what the data looks like. Um, and, and, and this is what it looks like. So you've got a, a, a network like a MLP. This is the data structure that we've defined. And you are given a bunch of input output pairs. That's it. <clears throat> so it's like um, a vector of input, which is a bunch of uh, numbers, um, and an output, which is another number, right? So that kind of answers your question in a more generic way. And then it gives us a single number, which is how bad we're doing. Right? Again, key concepts. So if, if this type signature doesn't make sense, please ask. And then how does this work? Uh, you have this network and you've got these samples. Let's explain this line by line. And again, I will explain what it does and not exactly why this is the best thing to do. We first compute the outputs that the network gives us. So we, we run call MLP, which is a function we've defined earlier on all the inputs, all the first elements of this uh, data set. Then we compute our loss. And the loss is the is so-called hinged loss. This is a loss that increases linearly 
as the output gets more different, the expected output, sorry, well, the actual output, the MLP output gets more different than the expected output. So that kind of makes sense intuitively, right? The more away we are from the ex expected output, the bigger the loss will be. And this is uh, uh, mm, like structured in a way that is well suited to these binary classifiers that are supposed to output minus two or one. It's called a hinge loss. Is that, uh, uh, linear in number of points that are misclassified? No, in the distance uh, between the uh, expected output and the actual output. So uh, this, we are doing this uh, point-wise, right? For every sample, we're computing uh, this loss, right? And then we take the average of this loss. But when I say linear, I mean that like as the distance uh, grows bigger, um, the loss grows bigger too. That's what I mean. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, and, and then, yeah, we compute this like this loss for each single input output pair. And then we take the average of these losses to get the overall loss. This is called the data loss as opposed to the regularization loss. Um, the regularization loss is uh, kind of a, um, it basically checks, it, 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 it penalizes networks with very large weights and biases. So it's simply the sum of the squares of each of the parameters. Again, note that this is a sum that assumes nothing of, uh, like it, it could work on any traversable, right? So it just goes generically over all the numbers, just squares them all up and then sums them, and then multiplies it by, a factor, right? Uh, we don't want this parameter to count for too much of the loss. Why is this sensible? Um, can't explain properly, but uh, here, but essentially, if you sort of keep the uh, parameters small, your network kind of is better behaved. It generalizes more to other inputs and uh, uh, sort of doesn't run into situations where some neurons like uh, this very uh, important, some others aren't. It's just a nice, it makes the, the network more well behaved. And this is a very simple loss function. I, I should say the overall loss is just uh, this sort of sums, this average of the losses of each the, of the expected output, expected versus actual output and the regularization loss. Um, so we just sum them together and that's the loss. And this is quite a simple loss function. Although again, like the actual loss functions that people use, and I'm not an expert here, but um, from what I saw, it's like, um, I'm not that far off from this. Um, what tends to be quite different is what tricks you put inside the network to make them work well. But, uh, but yeah, so, so that's kind of what it looks like. And this is the function we're doing gradient descent on, right? It's not the function we're trying to learn. It's just this function that computes how well we're doing. Again, this is very important to understand this. Like you, 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 you're taking this function that tells you how bad you're doing and you're minimizing that one. And this function has all the parameters in the network as inputs, essentially. Um, so, so, so that's what we're going to use as our loss function. And once we have this, we can use it just like we minimize the previous function with uh, 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 grad width. We're going to do exactly the same with the loss function here. So let's say that we've got a network and we've got a bunch of input output pairs and um, uh, we've got a learning rate. This is the gamma that we had before. This is the factor that we multiply the gradients by. Uh, in, in, in machine learning, it's always called learning rate. So I'm calling it learning rate here as well. And then we call grad width. The update rule is exactly the same as before we were subtracting because we want to minimize, not maximize the functions, which is sort of going downwards. This you know, 333 dimensional, 37 dimensional surface. <laughs> um, and then uh, the actual function that we're minimizing is the loss with uh, uh, the, um, uh, yeah, with the MLP as the argument. And we, um, Right, so what, what, what's happening here is that we're getting inputs of type A. We need to lift them to this fancy reverse data type, right? And this is what auto is doing, sort of going through all the inputs and it's calling auto on them because we need to sort of uh, lift them into this uh, more complicated data type that uh, GradWidth works with. Uh, so this function just does that. It's just tells automatic differentiation 
this is a constant, essentially. It's not a variable, it's just a constant. So when you do the derivatives, they're going to be treated as constants, essentially. Um, and again, note how the traversable instance for MLP lets us use this transparently with graduate. We don't need to do anything strange to tell it what the thing looks like. Um, so that's quite neat. And we're doing this for a bunch of inputs, but what happens very often in deep learning is that we do this repeatedly. So we take what are called batches of inputs. So there is, you know, 50 inputs and then 50 inputs and then 50 inputs. In real deep learning stuff is way more. And then we repeatedly do this, right? We say, okay, optimize for this batch of inputs, optimize for this batch and so on and so forth. And we get better and better. So that's what that graph was showing at the beginning. And I'm going to show you it again. It's like, how, you know, it gets better at every batch, right? It kind of refines uh, the network more and more. And also importantly, what we do here is that we decrease the learning rate as we go forward, uh, which is what this thing is doing. Uh, so the goal is that at the beginning, you want to make fast progress. So you have a high learning rate. So you make fast progress towards a minimum. And then as you go forward and forward in the training, you want to make, you want to take more cautious steps, let's say, towards a minimum so that you don't overshoot uh, uh, a minimum, like like gradient descent is sort of tricky. I've presented it as this sort of uh, surefire way to, to 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 find a minimum, but like it's 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 not so. Yeah, there are a lot of considerations. Let's say, especially for functions that are as complicated as the ones that we uh, that arise from this deep learning training. Um, but yeah, so we go forward, and at the beginning, the learning rate is going to be one, and then it goes down to point one at the end. And this terminology of epoch, so that's you know what step we're in the training, again, is very common in machine learning. You say at each batch, you've got a new epoch. This practice of doing many batches is called stochastic um, uh, gradient descent because you're optimizing for a different function each time because you're going to have a different set of inputs, right? So you kind of, uh, yeah, you're optimizing for a slightly different function each time. And this also can be nice because it adds some sort of noise to, to do this pro process, which is can be nice because yeah, um, you 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 can get stuck of local minima because you sort of move around a bit randomly essentially. But again, this is another, you know, you could talk about this sort of stuff for hour, for hours. But yeah, but the 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 basic idea is that you you keep iteratively optimizing your network. And in this case, we have a list of networks coming out, which is how I produce this graph, right? Uh, like. What I'm plotting and drawing here is like, this is the loss function for the current network. We've got 150 epochs in this case. And here I plot what the, from minus one to one, what the result of the network is. What the, you know, you what, what, what the network thinks is the upper and lower moon. So yeah, which we've already explained kind of what, what it means. Um, so what I'm going to show you as well is how the, um, well, how fast the thing is essentially. So if I share the entire desktop, so um, you should see, uh, let's see, let's close this maybe. Ooh, close too much. So, so this shows how, yeah. So this shows it's, it's training. This is very slow now, probably because of Zoom, but it's generally pretty slow. Uh, so it starts out with completely random stuff in it. So the accuracy, this is how many points are correctly identified in the, in the, in the um, what is that called? Not the training data. Well, the verification, what, what is it called when you verify? Because you usually separate the data you train your network in and you have a data set to verify that the network works well with other data. And this is what the, what, what, what is it showing? So it starts out with 30% of the points accurately mm, detected, which is of course really bad. And then we make quick progress to you know, 82, 83, like the accuracy steadily increasing. And then it gets to 99% and then it kind of oscillates a bit back and forth. It gets to 100% sometimes, but it ends up being you know, very accurate and with a low loss, which we are happy with. And this is what we are showing here. Uh, and uh, I want to stress that this is not at all as you would implement <laughs> this, 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 this backpropagation stuff for this network. It's very slow, but 
what's very good is that it's, it's less than 100 lines of code, uh, which, which makes it for a nice uh, exposition, I think. So that's it. Uh, that's, that's, that's all I had. And uh, we, can, we can ask more questions. So you can ask more questions or whatever you like, really. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Francesco, for the great talk. Yeah, we have uh, time for questions. So if anyone has any, shoot. In the graph, the black gap, um, it has different thickness. What does it signify? Right. So well, hi, hi, Nicholas. I haven't spoken to you in a couple of hours. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah. So um, what it signifies is that here, this sort of uh, valley, let's say, is a bit flatter, right? It's it it it's, it it it's got a less sharp division between the upper moon and the lower moon here, because here what I'm really plotting is something like between minus O1 to plus O1, right? So like the, yeah, it's sort of a bit less steep here, this function. I mean, we're not giving him it, it <laughs> any data here. Uh, I mean, what's happening in the corners is sort of meaningless in a sense. But yeah, like it means that this function is a bit less steep because I'm plotting, I, I'm drawing anything between I think 0.1 and 0 0.01, minus 0 0.01 and plus 0 0.01 in black. So that it's got a thick line and not like a one pixel line. So that, that's, that's what it means, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for the question, of course. I have another question. So looking at the shape of this line, it's, I mean, just seeing this now sort of naively, it looks to me like it kind of has vertices where uh, it, it bends off. Have you played with how this corresponds with the number of neurons? Uh, right. So first of all, it seems that you, you're absolutely right. And uh, uh, the fact that it's a segmented line, I haven't verified this, but it's almost certainly for the activation function that we're using. So the activation function that we're using is ReLU. And is, as, as I said, shockingly simple. It looks like this, um, the blue one, right? It just breaks the input into two parts. And the left part is totally flat, but the right part is also flat. I mean, of course the input might be some sort of curve, but it, it, it's still sort of segmenting the, 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 the data that it gets in a very dumb way. And I, I, I wanted to verify this. I wanted to swap uh, ReLU for um, uh, a more smooth function, like a sigmoid function usually. It's what people use before ReLU to see if those segments disappeared. Um, but, but but yeah. So what, what was your question? <laughs> Whether it depended on the neurons or not, right? So so if you have enough neurons, it will be totally smooth anyway because it's sort of it doesn't matter that the activation function is like this. It's just so many that it will be totally smooth. But it might be because of ReLU. Uh, I I want to verify this. Um, I'm not entirely sure. It's a suspicion. So when I first started looking at this, I was shocked that ReLU was enough. It's like really that's all the nonlinearity you need. It's like this seems very very strange. But not only it's enough, but it's also really nice because uh, it doesn't mess up with your, um, well, let's look at another function. So if you look at tan h or whatever, not, not h, just tan actually, or a logistic function, um, not in Italian. Uh, right, looks something like this, right? Now, what's annoying about this function is that when you get the gradients, the gradients are almost zero here, okay? That's really annoying because you're going to hit towards situations where a number, like this is called the vanishing gradient problem. You're going to get into a situation where in some parts of the, of the, of the, of the, of the result of the codomain, like you, 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 you have basically no gradients. And so there is very little information you can use to make progress towards gradient descent. And this, problem is mitigated by this ReLU stuff where, you know, of course there is a part where it's all zero, but the, the useful part preserves the gradients more. There is no squeezing happening, at, you know, in this area. Um, again, I'm not an expert on neural networks at all, but that's sort of my intuition of why ReLU works better. You didn't ask this question, but I, I thought I might give you this info anyway. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It's, it's, um, thanks for answering it. Yeah. It's very cool. I guess what Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Nicholas. <laughs> I wanted to ask the same thing or similar thing about the shape because the interesting thing is that the problem is kind of symmetric, right? But mm -hmm. on the left side, the, the black curve bends kind of very curved. Yeah. But on the middle and the right side, it's very 
diagonal and straight. So that's also interesting. That is interesting. I don't have an answer for you. Uh, there is probably some bias in the absolute numbers here. So this is minus of five to two. So this is a bigger number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe maybe this is what this is about, but I haven't verified this. So it's a good observation, but I don't know why. Is that asymmetry stable across different random initializations? Another good question I don't have the answer to. I don't know. I always um, initialize with the same number, yeah. The reason, the reason that we, we still make progress after reaching 100% accuracy and sometimes drop off 100% accuracy is because we're trying to find um, one with smaller biases and weights. Well, it's just as good, right? Um, no, it's not only that. So, so, so the regularization will have an effect, but let's say that you're close to the point here, right? Let's say that you're close to, actually, okay, I'm gonna explain this better. So, okay, so you have this function that you're optimizing for, and you're given a bunch of data. This data we hope is representative of all the data, but it won't be perfect. It's going to be, in my case, I use a hundred samples each, right? So you're kind of dancing around the peak here, right? You're kind of going around this peak here and the peak shifts a bit <laughs> because you, you don't have the whole universe of points, right? To, to work with. So you're kind of going around it a bit, but the, the, the hope is that uh, the network kind of generalizes more, right? Which is what the, 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 the regularization does. And that, I mean, we will probably just stop uh, sooner, really. I, I, I don't know. But like um, at that point, like if you look at this, if you look at this graph, what's shifting in and out of the line is like the sort of fairly noisy points anyway. So uh, it's fairly random at that point, like. Uh, I think, like you see, this point is annoying. Like it can be this, yeah. So, so maybe you are actually getting better, but like it so happens that one noisy point steps out of line. So yeah, you, you, I wouldn't look too much into the 99.7 to 100% switches. Yeah. Is that last point also included in the? I mean, it might not be included in some of the batches, right? Exactly. So actually, these points that you're seeing are in none of the batches. So a good practice thing to do when you're training this is to separate the training data and the validation data. That's what it's called, right? So you basically want to say, okay, I've got some data that I use just to see how well I'm doing. Forget the training data, right? And this is what we're, you're shown here. These points that I'm, I'm showing are not involved in the training process at all, right? So the training doesn't know about the point at all. Uh, so maybe it just couldn't train for it, yeah. So the, the comment I wanted to say was that uh, the AD package and the grad function, it, uh, you know, it's a really cool approach, uh, but, and the traversable makes it all nice and, you know, 100 lines of code. But it also the reason why, you know, it, it runs that slow because you're forced to use box vectors and, uh, uh, yeah. and the, multi the multiplication is, matrix multiplication is really slow and yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Like, I think there are many problems, actually. One problem is what you said, they're boxed. Um, another problem is that there are these batch operations that are not vectorized or parallelized in any way. But there's another structural problem, which is kind of connects to what Dominic said, is that if you know upfront, right, that you're doing the same operation everywhere, you know, a lot of times, you can compute the gradients more effectively as well, right? Mm -hmm. While AD knows nothing about this, it just does, you know, the, the naive thing. So you will never use this to train real networks. Uh, it, it, but it's it's neat that you can get so far with such a sort of naive approach. Yeah. Awesome. Any more questions? You you had a vector of neurons of A. Does it also work if you have a neuron of a vector of A? Kind of, can you also put the vector inside the neuron? Oh, uh, can I also put the vector inside the neuron? Uh, okay, here yeah, you, so do, you do your transpose of each layer, so to speak. Um, I think, I think that's what you're saying. Like, uh, mm -hmm. well, so like that e each neuron instead of containing an A contains a vector of A and so that the vector moves inside. So that inside the neuron, your weight vector becomes a weight matrix, a vector of vectors. 
I mean, this doesn't make sense in the case of multi-layer perception. Okay, so when people care about matrix multiplications in neural networks, it's because they're using convolutional neural networks, right? Uh, where you know you 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 actually have these two-dimensional niche, you know, you have two-dimensional operations in a sense, right? Uh, like uh, because because you 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 you're you're doing this sort of convolution for people that know what, what, what it is. But like in this case, with multi-layer perception, we're basically doing a bunch of dot products, right? So no, we don't really need a matrix in the neuron. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't really, uh, I mean, does it, does, it, does, it, does it have some sort of meaning here? You can, you can, if you look at the diagram. Again. Yeah, it's a big matrix multiply actually, yeah. For no, each... no, you're right. You could set it up as a big matrix multiply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually. So, for, so for example, the um, N, N2 uh, column, right? Yeah. The four things is the result yeah. of the N1 vector times all the yeah, yeah. 16 it's, weights. Yeah. You, 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 could, you could set this up as a matrix and then it's a single matrix multiplication um, for the inputs. No, you're right. Actually, I, I hadn't thought of that, but that's, 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 you, you, you would uh, have maybe. to set it up so it works that way, but but essentially you're you're doing a matrix multiply at each layer here, yeah. Actually, actually that's nice because like I, I, actually I thought of this because like if you take so so if you take away their activation function and you see each layer as a matrix multiplication, you're automatically you're proving that you don't need layers. Because you can collapse this, the, the whole network to a single matrix multiply because you just compose the matrices, right? So if you don't have the, the, the activation functions in between, you actually don't ever need multiple layers. You can just collapse everything to a single linear operation. Does, does that make sense? So, yeah. so that's a good way of looking at it, actually, yeah. So thanks for, for the good question, yeah. All right, so I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sounds, sounds like we no, uh, have no more questions. Um, yeah, once again, Francesca, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the great talk. It was really cool. Um, thanks, everyone, for the great questions and the great discussion. And um, yeah, I'll end the recording here. Yeah, and um, you can go to the website if you want this in blog post for. Uh, that oh yeah, maybe if you can share the link once more. Um. Yes. So 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 uh, yeah. So it's at the. It's this, for the code and the code links the blog post, and it's this from the, for the blog post. I'm also going to put it in the chat, so, we you can visit it if you like. Thanks a lot. Cool, and yeah, it was nice. Uh, being in this meetup again, it's, it's remote, but <laughs> next time maybe it's going to be local.